Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Uh, Today we're going to talk about on-farm research and more specifically the eFields report and process that was implemented by my co-host Elizabeth Hawkins last year and we've also got Sam Custer, Ag and Natural Resources Extension Educator over in Dark County who's participated in those um, projects the last few years. So welcome guys. Thanks Amanda. (laughs) Good to be with you ladies. So the eFields report was a national finalist last week at the National Association of County Agriculture Agents meeting, which is really exciting. Um, This is a strategy you came up with to get on-farm research results out to the public more quickly so they can use that in their decision-making process as they decide what they're going to do for next year. Yeah, Amanda. So eFields is Ohio's on-farm research network, and it has two main goals. The first is to conduct quality research that can help farmers improve farm management decisions, not only in terms of production, but also environmental quality and stewardship, which we know is very important in Ohio right now. Um, We do that through providing standardized protocols that our educators and farmers can use to work together to answer questions that are important to the agriculture community. And then the second main goal is to communicate these results as quickly as we can to farmers because we know that making decisions happens early, earlier and earlier every year it seems like. So our goal is to get this information in the hands of farmers immediately after the growing season ends and we wrap up harvest so that they can use that to make decisions on their farm. Yeah, I know as a county educator myself, it's been a huge benefit to have those protocols in place for people who want to do on-farm research, um, but also it's helpful for farmers because like you said, earlier and earlier those decisions have to be made. And while we still have peer-reviewed on-farm research reports, those take a long time to work through that process and usually aren't available until the next growing season. So, Sam, you've been involved in this the last couple years and have a lot of on-farm research over in Dark County. Um, Why did you decide to start working with farmers doing on-farm research? Well, as I came into this position six years ago, uh, Amanda and Elizabeth know my story. I came out of uh, public schools. I was an ag teacher and school administrator and had been away from production agriculture for some time. So I needed to get back connected with what was going on, experience uh, the latest technology from when I left uh, the family farm. So uh, doing on-farm research is a great way to do that. Uh, my whole goal was to answer some questions for myself. Uh, I can question a lot of things that people say so it was a great way for me to see firsthand uh, what we were teaching and to explain that to myself and experience it. I'm a hands-on type learner and secondly uh, it was a great way for me to build relationships with the farmers in Dark County uh, to get out and meet with them and work with them right out in their fields and in their offices uh, on a day-to-day basis. And you've had a great response with farmers in your county wanting to do this it seems like. Yes, as I get older and older, it's uh, kind of one of those things like, uh, do I want to keep doing as much as we're doing? But we're getting more and more farmers that are coming to us and saying, hey, we want to do some research with you like you're doing with Farmer A or Farmer B. So uh, we have added to our list and continue to add to our list those that we're working with. And and um, this year we're doing all kinds of new things. and. To be honest with you, I'd much rather be out in the field and on a tractor than in the office. (laughs) So it has worked out very well. So what are some of the projects you have in 2018? In 2018, we've added some new things, but we've, uh, this is our, um, I guess we've been doing seeding rate trials in soybeans for years. Um, This is our second year on a corn seeding rate trial. We're also doing manure side dress. We're over there in the western part of the state with a lot of livestock, and we have uh, but then manure side dressing, this is our fifth year of doing it with pulling a drag line hose. So uh, hopefully we'll get a journal article out this year to, to back up our research that we've done there and share that. 
Uh, this is our third year on a starter fertilizer trial. Uh, this is kind of a unique trial uh, that we've been doing. We go from everything from zero fertilizer at planting. Uh, we add 28% uh, 1034-0 sulfur and zinc. Uh, so third year of that. I'm hoping with this awesome growing season that we're having over in Dark County that we can uh, really truly get some facts there. The last two years have had been, been odd growing season so uh, this year will be real important to us for that. Uh, we were hit with frog eye uh, in Dark County early on. Uh, on. Well, the first week of July we started seeing the first signs of frog eye in our soybeans. So we've got some fungicide, pesticide uh, research out in soybeans. So we're looking forward to the information there uh, just to see if there is a return on investment there as we do those uh, applications at V3 or R3 on soybeans. And we've also got an, um, a V4 corn fungicide trial mm -hmm. as uh, retailers uh, continually push this early fungicide treatment out there. I uh, had a farmer work, work with me and say, can we put up a red, replicated plot to be able to see if that really will pay off for me. So that's what we've got going on this year. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one. Um, and just to touch on, because I think it's pretty cool, you guys have that manure side dress toolbar that farmers can borrow if they're interested in. Right. Glenn Arnold is our manure uh, nutrient specialist for the state of Ohio. And uh, we've got three uh, toolbars now that's owned by the university uh, that are on the western side of the state and, and uh, those are out there available for farmers that want to try this manure side dress work. Uh, four years of data so far show that in Dark County specifically that we've got a, almost a 15 bushel increase using manure over equivalent amounts of nitrogen. Uh, so we're real, real happy with that. In odd years, those years where we're extremely wet, the manure stays with us longer. We get that nitrogen value uh, more than the commercial. Our yield increase that year was 32 bushel the acre. And on a dry year, we get the advantage of that extra liquid too, so we've increased yields. Very cool. Um, what are some other results you've seen from the projects you had last year or in the past? So I'll talk about our soybean seeding rate trials first because I've done one of those every year. It's a pretty simple one to do and it's it's one that I think uh, we're having an impact on farmers in the in the area as they look at that. Uh, for a while there where we were pushing higher seeding rates as we um, took a look at new genetics and tried to maximize yields. So we've been doing seeding rate trials that have ranged from as low as 60 uh, intended units per acre planted up to 240 seeds dropped per acre. Uh, we don't always get that kind of uh, a germination to get 100% of that. Uh, this year we're at 80 up to 220 on our seeding rates. And, and I guess what I'd come to today is, and say is that soybeans are very adaptive. Uh, when we get out of there in the trial on those very high seeding rate trials, you'll see uh, a plant that it may be a single stalk very tall uh, beans spread out without within that stalk. The very same variety, you put that in a, a 60,000 count or an 80,000 count, and we have this bush bean that is just covered with beans. Um, and you look at those and you say, okay, where are we at here? Uh, what are we going to see yield wise? And uh, in the five years that I've been doing those seeding rate trials in soybeans, um, there may be a sweet spot, but from an economic perspective, um, we really don't see a, a significant difference in, in those uh, yields across that board. Uh, we do have to face some of those years in, over in our area getting soybeans out of the ground if we get them planted too thin. So probably our sweet spot when you look at it from just a, a yield perspective gets in that 130,000 uh, dropped range and we're real comfortable with that. And we really encourage farmers to take a look at dropping back from those 200,000 counts uh, to that 130 range. This year for the first time I've got uh, seed, soybean seeding rate trials out in 15 inch rows and 30 inch rows both. So we're kind of uh, interested to see how those real high counts do in those 30 inch rows uh, and down to those 80s. So we're in some really good soil with the 30 inch rows and, and look forward to seeing what those numbers look like. Yeah that'll be interesting. It seems like um, our specialists 
lean more towards the 15 inch rows but there's a lot of guys growing 30 inch rows out there as we've uh, got this planter technology out here uh, guys are putting a lot of money into corn planters and you know drills are kind of a thing of the past mm -hmm. uh, for the most part we just can't place our soybeans as well so with that additional investment in the corn planters it's hard to uh, only use that for on 40% of your acres and then put it back in the barn so um, the one farm with the 30 inch beans they continue to run their 15 inch row beans but planted half their soybeans with the 30 inch planter so it'll be interesting to see and there's and there's uh, other options for things to do with beans when you use those 30 inch planters if guys are trying to use a, a pop-up or uh, a biological uh, that they can place with those planters also yeah that's a great point and that you know it ties into economics too because um, if you're if you don't have to pay for another planter but you it'll be interesting to see how all that works out which kind of leads into um, the 2018 report um, and the new additions that we're going to see there. Yeah. Um, so our hope is to have the 2018 report out in early January of 2019. You know, all that depends on harvest and yeah. hopefully, I hate to say hopefully, if we get a couple more good rains, we can get a nice dry harvest and, and get the crop in and get that data processed to turn that report around. Um, some of the things that we're adding this year, I think Amanda, you can probably speak to it pretty well yourself. Um, you're taking the lead on adding an economic section to the 2018 report, which is very important because understanding, even if we're increasing yields, that doesn't always have a positive impact on the bottom line. So for some of these management practices where the cost is increased, does it pay off is the actual question that we should be asking, not necessarily just did it increase yields. So I think that'll be a very important addition to the 2018 report. Um, another thing that we're adding, uh, weather is something that we are constantly trying to figure out how to manage around since it's not something we can control. And Aaron Wilson, one of our past guests on the podcast, is going to be adding an expanded weather section going into some of the trends that we saw regionally to better understand the yield responses we see across the state. Yeah, that'll be great. Um, I just saw a report from Purdue, I think it was, and they made a statement in there that due to climate change, well, we're seeing yield loss from um, the warmer nighttime temperatures at a higher rate, I guess, than we're able to increase yields from genetics, better management practices, that kind of thing. So we are definitely starting to see some impacts from climate change, it sounds like. Yeah, I think along talking more about the report, one of the things that we were expecting to see was an increase in yield due to the increased carbon dioxide, okay. but it appears that that's being offset by the increased temperatures, which is kind of unfortunate. Yeah, and we have had some warm nighttime temperatures this year for sure. Yep. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, we're into the growing season pretty well now. Um, what you guys are seeing in your areas as far as expected yields, things like that. Sam, I don't know if you guys are pretty dry over that way or you had some breaks in rain. Actually, uh, Dark County has been a really interesting growing season this year. And, and um, we started off and didn't get in the fields at all until April 30th. Um, that was pretty much everybody started at the same time, April 30th, with planting corn. Uh, we pretty well planted all of our corn in about seven days, and soybeans were done maybe three or four days later than that. So we got everything planted between April 30th and May 15th, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, then we turned dry for the first couple of weeks in June, and we were a little bit concerned, but uh, the last six weeks have been almost ideal growing conditions. Uh, a little warm at night, uh, but last week we probably for the county on a, a median probably had a, about an inch and a half of rain. Oh, that's the great. week prior to that we had about an inch of rain. So uh, we're going into August here strong. If we can sneak out an inch of rain the next uh, couple days this week and then one more the week of the Dark County Fair, which will always happen, we'll get a, <laughs> a goose drowner then. Uh, we're, if, talking with the ag people there that have been in the county for 70 or 80 years, uh, we're easily going to see record yields in yeah. corn and soybeans in Dark County if we get those next two rains. Uh, corn is maturing quickly. 
um, with the growing year we've had. Uh, so we'll be two weeks early. Though you'll have all my stuff by October 15th, I think, all my information. So no excuses to, to get information out uh, here um, in January from a Dark County perspective. So we're really looking really strong right now. Probably our biggest issue now is weed escapes in soybeans. We're starting to see a lot of weeds and and uh, continually ask for our farmers to, to look for water hemp, look for palmer, and make sure you don't run that through the combine. Yeah, you guys are in that water hemp area that you're seeing it a little more heavily. So. Yes. Yeah, in my part of the state, it's, it's pretty similar. I'm just a little further east of Sam and a little bit south, but our weather trends were really similar. In fact, I've just started getting out and doing some yield checks in fields, and we're regularly finding ears that are 22 around, which is wow. pretty amazing. <laughs> um, you know, some of those aren't filled all the way to the tip, but it's looking like, you know, we're a garden spot and we're going to have a good yield. And especially even now we're starting to see those double crop soybeans. These rains are really crucial to those being made. Mm -hmm. And the same as Sam was saying, we've been catching about an inch a week, which is, is great for this time of year. Yeah, I mean, we, in western Champaign County, it's not looking too bad, but you get over into eastern and over around northern Madison County, even parts of Union I was driving through yesterday, there are definitely some dry areas out there. So it seems like this happens every year where you get the people that just miss the rains and other people get um, nice showers. So of course mother nature likes to throw curveballs at us but <laughs> yeah I, f I feel really bad for our friends on that northern tier of counties across the state of ohio that are that are out there that uh, had so much rain early on got planted late and then it's turned dry and they're you know they're in that drought monitor region that aaron wilson comes out with every couple of weeks and so i re feel really bad for them and you you do so in the northern half of the state um is struggling a little bit but Glenn Arnold uh, took a look at some corn in Putnam County and he reported on our corn call this morning um, a prediction of 250 bushel the acre so there is some good corn out there well I guess to wrap up here um, where can we find the eField report once it's published well it's not too late to check out the 2017 report if you're interested um, the e version can be looked at at go.osu.edu slash efields. And if you're going to come see us at the Farm Science Review, we have some printed books still available. Um, if you can't make it to the Farm Science Review, feel free to shoot us an email at digitalag at osu.edu, and we will be happy to send you a copy. The 2018 report will be available through the same ways and make sure you keep an eye on social media. Um, we will post when it's available and we'll probably also highlight some of our favorite studies. Oh, that's great. And of course, come out to extension events this winter. We have plenty of them and you can pick up a hard copy there, I'm sure. And Amanda and Elizabeth, one of the new things that's coming out this year to help promote eFields Rob Leeds out of Delaware County is taking the lead and he's doing a whole video series, promotional series, and then there'll be some short video clips to share some of the research we're doing. And I almost feel really bad about sharing this because uh, they were out and did a recording at our place and I'm highly embarrassed by the, <laughs> my video. But uh, for my friends out there that might listen, uh, you'll get a good laugh when you watch our promotional video on our starter fertilizer. Yeah, they're definitely a creative team, so make sure you check those out and get a little education and entertainment at the same time. Yeah, I can say without a doubt that if the extension gig doesn't work out for Sam, he has a future in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I doubt it. <laughs> well, thank you guys for all your hard work on the eFields on farm research. Thanks, Sam, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you to you ladies for letting me join you, and uh, I had the opportunity to come to Champaign County to visit Elizabeth and Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.